Hello, um, welcome. My name is Sarah Clark. I'm a student occupational therapist at Bournemouth Uni. I'm in my third year. I've just got a job working in mental health um, in a mental health rehab ward in Dorchester when I qualify in June. And I also work on the bank as a support worker at St Anne's Hospital, so I've kind of worked there for the past two years. Um, I never thought that I would be standing up here today telling people my story. There had been many times that I had lost all hope that things would get better, so I, I feel privileged to be able to stand up here today and speak to you. And also the subject matter, it, in terms of actually speaking about it, um, when I first approached James regarding the subject, um, it was I think it took quite a lot of thinking about and how it would work because of the, sub the sensitive nature of the topic. So I'm, I'm glad that we've kind of pushed all the boundaries and we, I've been able to, as a student, been able to speak to you today. And I hope my story can give hope, which I feel is one of the most important principles of recovery. One of the reasons that I really wanted to do this talk was it's something that's not often talked about. You hear a lot of people giving their stories of eating disorders and mental health, but not many people talk about talk about things like childhood trauma. And this, I feel, it reinforces the shame that people experience when they're wanting to tell people about it or they're wanting to discuss it with their family peers. It's, and it's similar to you know, the, experience, the um, stigma experience of mental illness. And you probably <coughs> agree that in the last few years that in terms of you know, people being able to speak about it, it has improved grassly where people have been able to speak about you know, their experiences and the stigma has you know, lessened to some degree. And when I looked at some research to do with eating disorders, and um, abuse. There was researchers have found that girls abused before the age of 16 were twice as likely to experience an eating disorder. I know there's plenty of risk factors, but I feel this is quite a significant one that you know isn't talked about. And studies also show that the one thing missed during eating disorders assessments was that. And it's and if we don't talk about it with people who access services, how can we? kind of expect them to, to speak about it in a, in a way. And for me, it was a really important part of my recovery. I wouldn't have, you know, gone into recovery if, if I wasn't able to kind of speak about that because it was a really kind of important thing for me to be able to talk about. Just going to go through the aims of the talk. Um, so I'm going to speak to you about my story and I hope that you have a better understanding of the challenges that individuals may face when dealing with childhood trauma and having an eating disorder. So I'm going to look at the link to body image and how gaining weight for me made memories resurface and how anorexia kept me safe and it kept me protected. I'm going to give hope, hopefully, that despite childhood trauma you can lead a fulfilling life and challenge views that it's something that should be talked about more and how exercise has helped me attain a more healthy body weight. Next slide. <laughs> okay, so it's just some photos of see the life that I've got now. Um, so my story, I was brought up in Devon, originally from Devon. Um, I only moved up to uni when I attended, um, attended university here. Um, my live with my sister, who's there's 18 months age gap between us, so there's we had quite a lot of sister rivalry when we were younger. <laughs> I'm not sure if she was here today, she would definitely agree with. Um, and my parents split up when I was quite young. I can't really remember what age, but I remember my dad not being around that much. And um, between the ages of seven and ten, I was uh, sexually abused by a family friend. Um, this sort of start, started off with me staying over at weekends. Um, gradually, you know, over the years, I kind of, you know, I knew it was wrong what was happening. Um, I kind of said to my mum, oh, I don't want to stay over. Um, I didn't actually tell her what, you know, what the plan was. Um, and I wanted it to stop. Um, I didn't feel able to speak to my mum. So I, I spoke to, a, to quite a good family friend that we had, um, and then she told my mum. And um, my mum's reaction was a lot of... Um, she kind of she blamed me. Well, she didn't really say it was my fault, but she was very angry. She was worried about social services getting involved. She, was, she didn't want to be seen, understandably, as a, as a bad mother. Um, so I had this a lot of shame that it was my fault as I was a child and I remember that night that I 
all happened. I told my mum and social services and all that sort of stuff happened. That I um I remember I go into, went to the cupboard. I was about ten, and I, I took some pills. Um, it wasn't to kill myself. I don't think. I think it was just just to escape, really. Um, I just felt, oh God, I, I don't want to wake up the next day. I don't know how to to cope with everything. Um, I don't blame my mum. My mum's got a lot of mental health problems herself, and I knew she loved me and. I feel that it was her way of expressing the guilt and anger towards what had happened. She obviously, you know, understandably probably felt guilty and that, you know, that she, it was her way of expressing what happened. Um, reflecting on this event now, it wasn't just the abuse that really affected me, it was my mum's reaction. Um, and this led me to feel feelings of shame and guilt. And this carried on throughout my childhood and, you know, still today to some degree. You're, when you're young, you're very influenced by your parents. And I grew up where I had such intense guilt. I feel that if it was handled better, I feel that maybe my mum's reaction was different. If I had some support from mental health services at that age, I feel that it would have you know, lessened the impact that it had on me. And I personally think that early intervention within mental health services is, is so crucial before it gets to that stage where you can't you know, you've experienced stuff for so long that actually when you receive the support that, you know, you're not in that place to actually be able to take in that, um, take in that support and gain from having that support. Um, so up until the age of 13, um, I kind of, I guess, I didn't begin to experience any mental health problems till about that age. And I was bullied at school. Um, home life was quite difficult and I began self-harming. Um, this was a way just to, I don't really know how it happened really, I just, you know, just started to self-harm and it made me feel better about what, what everything was going on in my life. At this time, my mum had, you know, quite a lot of mental health difficulties, but she was never really diagnosed at that time. And my mum and dad had a very on-off relationship. Um, they wasn't around, my dad wasn't around when the abuse happened. And I th I had a lot of anger growing up, which I couldn't express, so I kind of expressed that in ways like self-harming and other ways, which began when I was about 15. I started to, to develop um, puberty and things. I felt vulnerable. I was never a skinny child. My sister was seen as a slim one, and my mum reminded us of, these, of this. I was sort of seen as the pretty one, and my sister was seen as the, oh, she's quite thin and clever. Um, so we both grew up thinking that I was dumb and uh, <laughs> she, she was ugly. So um, I started to, to binge and purge as this kind of, kind of blocked out how rubbish I felt. I didn't really lose weight for it. It was around this time also that I started taking overdoses. Became very depressed from the age of 15. Um, my sister went into foster care at this time and my mum was also very unwell. She had a few um, hospital admissions for trying to take her own life as well. And I did a performing arts course at uni, not uni, at college when I left at 16 um, in dance and drama. And then I didn't really know what to do. I didn't go to uni. I was born, I'll take a year out and I got a job in a bar. And um, so I, was, I was, feel I was quite vulnerable at that age. I, and I was... Um, I was sexually assaulted by my boss at work and um, some of the girls told me to be wary of this man and so I thought, oh, I want to, you know, I wasn't going to go to the police, um, but I went to the police and the way they handled it was, again, I was left to feel that it was my fault. I was a silly 18-year-old girl, you know, thinks their boss fancies her and so I, you know, it wasn't handled very well at all. Um, and then from this, uh, memories of being abused as a child resurfaced and the guilt got worse. And so this is when I remember like the anorexia really starting to take hold. I gradually started to lose weight. I wasn't overweight, but you know, when you're at that age, you think, oh, I could do with losing a few pounds and things. It felt good. I had compliments, people telling me, oh, you look, you look good. Um, gave me something else to focus on as well. I found it it helped block out memories. Um, it made me feel better about myself. And as I lost weight, I gave me a sense of control. Something that I felt that I could be good at, something that was mine. I'd always been a perfectionist. And 
actually it was something that I could be good at. I could, I've got control, I can lose weight, I can, you know, still remember feeling the excitement of seeing the number go down on the scale, like, you know, like I've won the lottery or something, it would be that sort of feeling. Um, and the guilt from, that I had from my childhood and growing up, that transferred into eating certain foods where I couldn't allow myself things that were deemed as treats. Um, and it was all about deserving things. I felt I didn't deserve food, I wouldn't buy stuff for myself. I felt I deserved everything that happened to me and I, I had this very self-hatred for myself during this time. It took a while for anorexia to be noticed. Um, eventually my mum, with her mental health, she became aware that things weren't right. So I went to the GP um, and his reaction was to go home and eat some burgers and come back in two weeks. <laughs> Obviously the burgers didn't get et, I came back in two weeks and I'd lost weight and gradually um, I was quite in denial at this time. I couldn't say the word anorexia. It just didn't apply to me. I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't even apply that person of someone with that illness to myself. And I got referred to the community mental health team. And at this stage, my illness had pretty taken over. Um, I didn't want to gain weight. I couldn't see that I was, you know, I was underweight. The illness had kept me safe. It'd been my safe, safety blanket. And I look back on photos now of when I was unwell, and I think, I'm shocked at how awful I look. But I remember that taking that particular photo and actually having that photo taken, think, oh, you can lose, your arms look a bit bigger there, you know, your legs are a bit big. And I remember, like, thinking that, you know, you know, you can lose weight there. And it's, you know, now, and I think, I was like, so strange like, how I just think that when you would look in the mirror and just see this, this fat person, um, and eventually I had to leave work. I was working in a mobile phone shop at the time. And I had a few general hospital admissions, so I was admitted to um, like a general hospital side where I had quite a few physical problems in terms of, as gradually when you do become very un underweight, you experience things like heart problems and to do with the malnutrition side of things and kidneys. And, so I'd, and then I eventually uh, agreed to admission um, to a specialist eating disorder unit. I knew deep down that I really couldn't carry on, but part of me wanted me, you know, to go to hospital. Part of me was terrified. I had severe depression, and I, I part of me wanted the illness to kill me, and the other part wanted me to, you know, try and lead, you know, try and get better somehow. Um, the first, I had three admissions over the years. Um, the first time I admitted to hospital was a strange, you know, I've never sort of been in a hospital before, um, but I felt accepted. There was people there with pretty much the same problem with me so I you know I had friends there when I was unwell I lost lots of friends um, gradually people drift apart a lot of social occasions involve food and obviously that was an anxiety provoking event for me so I lost you know I lost a lot of friends over the years they went to uni um, and also the staff cared I'm not saying that my mum never cared for me she really did but I felt like a carer for my mum. When my sister went into foster care, I was, you know, looking after my mum, and I felt a lot of responsibility for my mum. And so I felt that, you know, actually having staff there that I could talk to really helped. Obviously, a lot of people with eating disorders hated the weight gain side of it, but there's part of me that I admit now to that secretly enjoyed the food, although I'd never admit it at the time. And I remember people saying to me, oh, don't you miss things like chocolate? And I was a bit like, Oh yeah, I do actually. <laughs> it wasn't. It was never about that. I didn't enjoy the food. It was just that it controlled me, and the only way that I could cope was through not eating, and it just became a coping mechanism. So each each admission I have, I felt I felt like being. It was let out of prison, really. Um, in fact, one staff member even said that to me, and it was that you know that feeling of relief, but also that feeling of feeling scared. And as I knew, as soon as I left that hospital, I'd be losing weight. After each admission, it was almost a cycle. Over the years, I would lose weight. I would not meet up with my CPN, so I'd disengage from the services until I eventually got caught out and had to be readmitted. The illness made me very secretive and, you know, get to know all the tricks in the book, how to cover your weight up. And, and I had some therapy in the community, but I wasn't ready for it. I feel to have... You can, you know, it's like bringing a horse to water, it doesn't want to drink, it's not going to drink. I 
didn't, you know, I wasn't ready for the therapy. I just kind of did it as that's a thing you're meant to do when you're unwell, you're meant to receive treatment. Um, but for each admission, I did learn more about myself. I began to open up and each admission I got a bit stronger, really. I kind of developed different skills to, to use. Um, for many people with anorexia, a big fear, obviously, is gaining weight. Um, and for me, that was about losing my identity of, of anorexia, really, and becoming a woman. It kept me safe, it being my only friend's comfort blanket, where I felt that no one could hurt me. Whenever I gained weight, I began to experience flashbacks from what happened in my childhood. And I also knew that if I was to gain to a healthy BMI, it would involve relationships and finding out who I was, which I don't think that I was prepared for. The third admission that I had, um, which was the final one, to an eating disorder unit, was the worst that I'd been physically and weight-wise. And it almost felt like a game, like how low I could go before I got caught out. I couldn't stop the laxatives, the compulsive exercise. I hated the illness, but at the same time, weight gain terrified me. But mentally, I was the wellest that I had been. I was ready to change, and I wanted to change. And over the years, I just I had that insight into my illness, which I didn't have at the beginning of when I became unwell. And I was also very physically unwell. There was one time that I remember being tied up to a heart rate monitor in the hospital and I had to go into intensive care. And I remember at the time thinking, oh God, I don't want to die. I promise, you know, if I get through tonight, I'll, I'll eat in the morning. And, you know, and I had this, you know, I was like, oh, I've, you know, although I want to die, I really don't want to die. And so I remember that. And then the next day when I, next few days when I came out of hospital, I'd get home and be faced with a meal and it'd be like, no, I can't. You know, I've survived this. I can survive. You always think you're invincible. Like, you can... Any, any, you, you know, you always hear the horror stories of people dying. And the fact is, you don't ever think that it would happen to you. And you think that you're, you can be the best at it. And actually, the best anorexia is a dead one. That's the only way that the illness has actually won. Um, so during my inpatient treatment, I started work with a psychologist um, regarding the flashbacks that I was experiencing. And so we looked at grounding techniques. Um, and it helped me come to terms with what was going on in my head. And also, the unit introduced a form of dialectical behavioural therapy. Um, unlike traditional DBT, which is for people who experience a lack of control, it's for people with emotionally over-control. So I've tried CBT before, which was about changing my thinking pattern, but I had the thinking pattern for so long that I couldn't change it. <laughs> so, and it works for some people, but for me, that wasn't the right thing to do. And I began to find ways to manage distress and um, grounding techniques, and it's something that I can use in day-to-day -day life, it's something I can use now, and I think it's something you can use in any stage of recovery as well. Um, I think it can be useful for anyone, really. <laughs> we, all, we all experience, we all, you know, you hear on, you know, people on Facebook, oh, I've had a bad day, I'm going to have a glass of wine, or, you know, I'm going to drink loads and stuff like that, and it's, we all have unhealthy coping mechanisms, and it's about kind of finding coping mechanisms. So it's something that I'm quite passionate about. It's, I find it really good. Um, so after that admission, um, for me, hospital was really about, I guess, getting me out of a crisis. And it saved my life, if I'm perfectly honest. Um, there'd be times where I was, you know, very close to, you know, not surviving. Um, but one of the most important things I did for my recovery was I went into supported housing. Every time that I went home, I went back to my mum's, it always resulted in relapse, where our illnesses both fed off each other. I felt like the care of my mum, and the relationship was never really a healthy one. Um, and even when I started to, re to recover, our relationship grew apart somehow, because she saw, still saw me as a sick person, and she didn't like the fact that I was, you know, becoming well again and having my, you know, our relationship kind of change from that moment. Um, so I entered supported housing. At this time, I was, I was still a low weight, but other things had to improve before I could begin to overcome the illness. Um, previously, um, recovery to me was seen as a cure in hospital when you had to completely let go of your illness. It was like there was no kind of, no kind of middle ground. And I couldn't imagine living without anorexia could it be my only coping mechanism. And then from the place I was in, they had a very recovery 
a focused approach and I began to see it as a way to manage my illness and do the things that are important to me, whether or not I still experience symptoms. So I learned a very long journey of self-discovery and one of which I'm still on today. I began to find my own identity and to break free from the constraints that my illness had on me. During this time there, I also received therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder, which had led me to cope with unhelpful coping mechanisms. It was challenging as when you receive a therapy of that sort, you, have, you, have, you, know, you begin to experience what had happened to you. Um, but you know, the supported house place, they gave me additional support. Um, they had, it was a staff 24 hours a day, so they had someone there at night. Um, so when old memories came to resurface, I kind of, you know, began to find ways to cope. And it was difficult at times, you know, I would return to unhealthy behaviours, but that was a kind of a learning process for me. And I found ways to manage the flashback and the memories, and also accept my body growing into that of a woman. Um, I began to accept that the abuse, it wasn't my fault, and I felt less guilty. And also the anger that I had that I hadn't been able to express. I was able to express that during therapy as well. Um, the one thing that really did help my body image was exercise. I know it's a red light when people with anorexia exercise, and at first it was a way to please the illness, you know. I'd always struggled with over-exercising, um, but I took up I took up cycling and it wasn't it just didn't wasn't just the cycling it gave me a purpose it gave me an identity and something that I felt that I could be good at big part of you know of my illness was about thinking that I could be good at something thinking that I had something that I had of my own and all the years that I was, I was ill I kind of lost sight of who I was and it's very easy to see yourself as an illness and not as a person and to almost take anorexia as a career why? Because it feels comforting, it feels safe, it's within your comfort levels. It's the same with people who don't like changing jobs. People can stay on the same job for years, but actually change is difficult for a lot of people. And in all honesty, I was scared of growing up and scared of who I was. Exercise also gave me feelings of euphoria. It was similar to the feeling that I got when I lost weight. So when I saw the number go down on the scale, I'd feel really pleased. And with cycling, I used to love going on long rides and also I've never been able to do things gradually. So I'm very much an all or nothing person, which meant that cycling 60 miles a day was a relatively easy achievement for me. And as I've been used to pushing my body to extremes and I couldn't recognise feelings of hunger, tiredness, I've always pushed my body. So I of course had to be aware of this over the years and a lot of people who know me say that I do like to keep busy. But gradually I've tried to, you know, I've learnt now to be able to handle that better and learn to rest, which is important as well, as well as keeping busy. Um, so that's something that, you know, that's taken me, you know, a while to, to recognise. And um, when I thought about recovery, I didn't wake up overnight and decide, well, today will be the day that, you know, I'll be magically recovered, I'll eat three meals a day and ten snacks a day. Things gradually led up to it. I began to find my own identity. The illness had been my identity for so long and I was beginning to find out who I was. I remember attending my younger sister's graduation and that was, you know, quite difficult because my sister, my younger sister was graduating and here was me going back to my supported house place and I sort of thought, hmm, what can I, I need to do something with my life and I was, you know, I was at the stage where I was, you know, getting into recovery and um, I was still, you know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a normal weight at that time and then I thought of training to be an occupational therapist. Um, I remember the OT I met on the wards and she had been my DBT therapist and she helped me move into supported housing and I also remember doing some card making. <laughs> that wasn't, I know OT is not just about card making but I thought oh, that sounds like fun so. <laughs> um, and so when I looked into it more I realised how my own activities of cycling had really helped my recovery. And when I think about it now, it's only now that I can realise, you know, recognise how important it, has, it is to have routine and meaning in your life, which is a big role of, you know, occupational therapy in terms of giving people that structure. And so then I thought of training to be an OT. And over the years, I also became closer to my dad. When I first become unwell, 
he thought it would be just be a phase, something that I would snap out of. He didn't really understand what the illness was about. He almost thought it was to do with, you know, like looking like a model, you know, wanting to, you know, want to be thin. But over the years, when he saw how unwell I got, and he also understood what it'd been like living with my mum um, over the years, and I was able to speak to him openly about my illness, and I also opened up to him about the abuse. And when I told him that, he really understood, like, why, why this happened and what why it led me to become unwell and we've still got a very close relationship now I, although it's you know sometimes people think it's easier to talk to you know females it's actually from the side of my family it's easier to talk to my dad about things because he really understands and really he really does kind of get it if you know what I mean um and so I then I applied I applied to do an access course um this was challenging as despite all the work I've done in supported housing I was quite institutionalized like didn't know how to have kind of normal conversations with people. The people that I had conversations I had with people in hospital and in you know mental health settings. They're not the you know it was about you know that nurse or you know what staff are like and things like that. And it was it was never right really like you know stuff. And people in my course they had babies, families, children, and I spent most of my teenage and adult years being involved in the mental health system. So I kind of, I felt quite alone. I remember crying for the first few weeks, thinking that I don't know if I can do it. Uh, my illness has given me a lot of determination. I was very <laughs> determined to lose weight. And this determination has now transferred into getting myself better. And like, with applying to uni and doing the access course. So I, I, did, I did stick out to it. Um, after the access course, well, the route was to university. Um, I was meant to go to university after doing my access course, but my place was actually deferred by the university. Um, it was a decision that I don't agree with now. Um, luckily, there's no OT lecturers in here, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, but that, um, I feel that more support needs to be given to students who may experience mental health problems at university to actually, and to realise that you can actually work within mental health if you've got lived experience. Um, there's a project that if anyone works for Dorset Healthcare that I'm involved with called Hidden Talent, which is about recognising the lived experience of staff. And I think that's really important for students to be aware of, that I was told that I couldn't have a mental health placement for my first two years. Um, I had one in my second year and I got, you know, very good mark on it. And the, it just, you know, it just shows that just because you've had an illness, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't sh change who you are. And actually, you know, you've got the skills to be able to you know, engage with that person and you know what it's like for that person. And so I, I should thank them really as I met my now husband. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Having a relationship was a very big step in my recovery. I was 24 and I'd never had a boyfriend. Due to my bad experiences with men, I never thought that I could ever trust a man again. And also at this stage in my life, I became a born-again teenager. <laughs> I, was, I admit now to even being young for my age. Um, most people know me. I've got more Hello Kitty stuff than most seven-year-olds have got, but I don't care. <laughs> um, I think when you do become unwell, you do, you don't, I wasn't, I didn't kind of grow up, if you know what I mean, so I'm not saying I'm immature for my age, you know, I'm, I've got, you know, being a care of my mum, you know, I did grow up, but, you know, there's this sort of side of me that actually hasn't experienced what it's like to be a teenager, so I started going out and, you know, I met Andy on one of those um, six pounds a night bottle of wine nights, um, and I became close to this girl in supported housing, and um, we used to go out on nights out, she'd been in hospital, so we kind of had a really strong relationship. Um, and alcohol helped my confidence, and I'd only just allowed myself to drink because of the fear of calories from it. Um, me and Andy went on a few dates. <laughs> and started to get to know each other. Um, I was very nearly a normal body weight at this stage, so I was feeling quite uncomfortable in my own skin. Unfortunately, during this time, my friend in supported housing died. It was initially presumed that she took her own life. It turned out later on that she didn't, but this event really affected me. Um, I kind of blame myself a bit for it. Um, 
that you do, I think, with people with, you know, with mental health, because you think, oh, what if I could have done something? Um, and I became really unwell. Um, this was, it was still with, I lost quite a bit of weight at this time, but it was more so with the depression. And um, me and Andy had only been together a month, and I took quite a few overdoses in that time and ended up being sectioned um, in hospital. So I sent him a message saying, you know, um, I'm a bit crazy. I don't think you <laughs> really want to be with me. <laughs> Expecting him to run for the hills as, as I presume that, you know, most men would only been together for about a month. Um, but despite this, he stood by me. And um, sorry, I might cry. <laughs> Gradually, I opened up to him and I began to trust him. I realised that he loved me for who I was. It took a lot of time and patience. And I can truly say I wouldn't be where I was if it wasn't because of him. Um, I never thought I'd be married, sorry, <laughs> let alone have a relationship. Um, and he restored my faith in men again. Being honest with him about my experiences has made things so much easier. And I would encourage other people who work people who've experienced similar things to, to just be honest and just be there for each other. We are now married and he is studying to be a mental health nurse. Mm. It's a career that he wouldn't have chosen if he hadn't have met me. When I first met Andy, he was working in a coffee shop. Um, I worked in a, I think in a, a pub at that time actually, and um, I said to him, oh, you, you know, you're very caring, you should go and do a caring job, so we got a, a job in a, a, a nursing home. And he said the most difficult part was working out the difference between a petticoat and a nighty. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know now? <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I, you know, I said to him, you know, you need. To, he's so good with me, and um, and so he decided then when I moved down to Bournemouth, we both went for an interview at St Anne's Hospital together. We kind of at that time. We, couldn't t t let people know that we were together, so we kind of pretended that we didn't know each other. <laughs> <laughs> we both got the job, which was good. It would have been a bit awkward yeah. if one of us got the job and the other person didn't. And since then, he's um, recently had a placement, actually, with an eating disorders unit at St Anne's Hospital. It's a placement that he really enjoyed. I'm just glad I didn't put him off. <laughs> and I know that a lot of people who've worked with Andy have said what a great nurse he is as well. <laughs> Okay, um, presently I'm still in recovery. I don't claim to be recovered. I still have blips, I still have bad days, good days, but to me that's okay as recovery is about doing the things that are important to you with or without symptoms. And it takes a long time for your head to catch up with your body. Gaining weight is the easy part of the illness. Actually, coping with everything else is the more hard part and the challenging part that it doesn't happen overnight. Um, I didn't wake up one day and think, you know, today's the day, I'll be fine. And my experiences have made me ha who I am today. I'm passionate about raising awareness of, of mental health problems, of eating disorders and sexual abuse. As I feel the more it's talked about, the more that, you know, it can lessen that stigma for people and it can make people, you know, feel more able to speak about it. I work in mental health and I feel that my personal experiences can be seen as an asset and certainly not as a barrier. I would never claim to understand what an individual is feeling as all our experiences are unique to us. However, I understand the challenges that recovery faces and I feel this makes me a more reflective practitioner. Although I wouldn't wish what has happened to me to happen to anyone, I'm at the stage now where I'm looking beyond the difficulties that I've faced and more to how my journey has made me a stronger person. Okay, that's the end. <laughs>